ancestors worked hard, and there wasn't much to spare. So if they wanted new clothes, they made them. It was just that simple. And their handwork often became heirlooms, handed down from generation to generation. Maybe life is easier today, and maybe we are in a bigger hurry. But we can still take time to create heirlooms, and that is time worth spending. Heirlooms by Design with Sharon LaMonaco is sponsored by Capital Imports, your passport for fine lace, embroideries, and fabrics, by OmniGrid, the most accurate and versatile products for the quilter, artist, and craftsperson, and by Quilts Plus, your authorized Bernina dealer. Now, here's Sharon. Hi. I'm Sharon LaMonica. Thanks for joining me today on Heirlooms by Design. The technique that I'll show you today is one of my favorites, French sewing by machine. This is a very easy technique. Now, I know I tell you that every week, but have I steered you wrong yet? French sewing by machine has been described as the easiest sewing technique that produces the most elaborate results. Basically, with French machine sewing, we're going to create our fabric first and then cut out our pattern. We create our fabric by joining various laces, Swiss embroideries, and entredos and different types of fabrics. Let's take a look at some of the samples and I'll show you what I mean. On this little boy's outfit, I have first created the fabric for the front, which also is like the blouse I'm wearing. I've joined uh, insertion lace and entredo with beading and then applied that to batiste with pin tucks. The little button on pants are of uh, Irish linen and this matches the little girl's outfit it's basically the same configuration of insertion beading and entredo and with the little girls underneath we have the same on the dress so she really can have two little outfits this is a um, pretty little dress that was in Martha Poland's So Beautiful magazine and this has some shaped insertion which is a lot of fun to do now, you know, with French machine sewing, we're not limited to just children's things. I'd like to show you these ladies' blouses. This one here is made of imperial batiste. It's very washable and real wearable. It's just like the one that I have on. And it, again, it's with the pin tucks, the in, uh, decorative stitches from my sewing machine, more pin tucks, entredo, and insertion and beading. This Victorian blouse under here is a Swiss batiste, and these tucks are actually tucked and stitched. This one is an example of a commercial pattern that I took and adapted it to French machine sewing. I've created a piece of pin tuck fabric for the yoke in the top of the sleeves and then used my beading and insertion for the rest of the design. The stitches in the middle are stitches from my sewing machine. Now I'll show you some of the basics in French machine sewing. First, I'd like to go over with you some of the things that we'll be using for French sewing by machine. Now, first of all, let me show you the entredeau. This is a piece of a Swiss batiste that is stitched in the middle, so it makes little holes. The outside edge is a seam allowance, and sometimes we'll be cutting this seam allowance off, and sometimes we'll be using it. The next thing is beading. Beading is um, lots of fun to use. You can run uh, ribbons down through the middle of it. You can put entredeau on, on each side of it or you can just join it to the uh, edge laces. This is an edge lace right here. Or, or excuse me, an insertion lace. It has characterized by two straight edges and this is usually put into a piece of fabric between two pieces of fabric. This is an edge lace and is characterized by the scalloping on the edge with one flat side. Then we have a piece of Swiss entredeau with beading. Now this is fun to use because it does save a lot of time. It, it saves the step of having to, to stitch the entredeau to the beading. And you can also put a skinny ribbon through the middle. This piece of fabric is a Swiss embroidery. And this particular one is done in a very, very pale pink with green. And this is meant to be an insertion. 
And the last piece I have to show you is also a Swiss embroidery. This is intended to be gathered for a ruffle. You can also use this um, and on the edge of a dress or an edge of beautiful sleeves or to smock it for a collar. Now let's look at some of the sewing machine feet that we'll be using. My favorite foot for joining the laces is foot number 10. And this guides the lace and the entredeau beautifully to allow us to join them and have a nice straight seam. Sometimes when I want to really get down and, and push the lace, for example, for gathering lace, I like to use the foot number 20, the open toe uh, applique foot. And for rolling and whipping the edges of our batiste and our entredeau, I like to use this rolled hemmer. We used to use these for hemming shirt tails, but it's great to use to roll and whip the edges of your uh, Swiss batiste. And then a, a pointy tweezer helps and some assorted cutting tools and some small scissors is about what we'll need. Spray starch helps or our spray sizing works well because we're going to be starching and pressing all of our lace and our entredeaux and our fabrics. Sharon will be right back. Now the first thing I'm going to show you is how to join entredeau to flat fabric and then roll and whip the edge. Now I'm going to be using a colored rayon machine embroidery thread so that you can see what it is that I'm doing. However, you will want to use an extra fine thread. I like to use DMC 50 weight. We want the thread to really blend into our fabric and our laces so that we don't see it. The first thing I'm going to do, now I have foot number 10 on, and I have selected a straight stitch, and I want the needle to land exactly by the side of the entredeau, so I'm going to move my needle position one position to the left. And I'm using about a two and a half stitch length for this. We don't need to have this particularly short. We'll just stitch it all the way down the edge of the entredeau being sure that we stitch exactly in the ditch of the entredeau and not going into the holes. Now the next thing I'm going to do is trim the batiste from the back of the entredeau and trim it about halfway down and try not to cut the selvage of our entredeau. This is a case where we're going to be using the selvage and it really does help to have nice sharp scissors for this. Now I'm ready to roll and whip the edge. The first thing I'm going to do is change the foot and go to foot number 68. I'm also going to select, first, before I select my zigzag stitch, we want to do a straight stitch. I want to make a little tail on this piece of entredeau and batiste so that I have something to hold on to to move the uh, fabric through the roll in the uh, rolled foot. Now here's my little tail. I'm going to select next the zigzag stitch. And I want a wide width. I'm going to put it at about um, a three and a half for a width and about one and a half length. Then holding your thread tail, guide it through the curve of the uh, foot on, your, on foot number 68 and get, it, get the curve started. Now I want the left hand swing of my needle to hit just on my previous seam line. And I want the right hand swing of the needle to go off of the fabric. And the curve that's in the foot helps the uh, batiste of the entredeau to roll over the edge of the fabric. Now we have a nice uniform rolled edge. There's no raw edge. And when we press this, the seam allowance will automatically fall away from the holes of the entredeau. So now remember, there are three steps to this. First is to stitch your entredeau to the fabric 
trim the batiste on the fabric and then roll and whip the entredeau using your rolled hem foot. Next we'll go on to joining some lace to lace. Now we're going to join some lace edging to entredeau. The first thing that we've done, I've starched and pressed my lace and my entredeau, and I'm going to trim the seam allowance off of one side of the entredeau. You do not want to trim the seam allowance off of both sides or you'll have nothing to hold on to. Now again with a zigzag, and we're back to foot number 10. I'm going to position the lace under one side of foot number 10, and I'm going to position my entredeau on the other side. Now I want the zigzag wide enough to land in the left hand swing of the needle to land in the hole of the entredeau and the right hand swing of the needle to cover the lace heading. And I see that this is a little narrow, so I'm gonna to go to about a two and a quarter, but I'm also going to move my needle position one position to the left. And I think that will better accommodate the lace heading and the hole in the entredeau. Now I want it just a little smidge wider. I like to try to hit each hole in the entredeau. Once you get your needle settings adjusted, your width and your length, you can just sail right through this. And there we've joined our lace edging to entredeau. Now, if we wanted to add another piece of lace to the other side, we would now trim the entredeau, or this is ready to be applied to a piece of fabric, just like we applied the entredeau a few moments ago. I'd like you to take a look at this piece. This is how it will look when you are using the same color thread, so you can see that we don't see any of those stitches at all. Now we're going to join some flat lace to another piece of flat lace, and this can be an insertion lace, or in this case, we're using the beading. Again, line up your, the head, your lace heading side by side under your presser foot. I have a zigzag width of about two and a smidge, and I'm using a just barely left needle position. And you just want your zigzag to cover the lace heading. And hold your lace gently in front. Don't stretch it because the lace can stretch very easily. That's one of the reasons that we starch it nicely before we sew. Now you can see that this piece of lace is joined and it's ready to have a piece of entredeau put on one side or it could even be applied to the fabric just as it is. We'll be right back. This new product presentation with Hollis Turnbow is brought to you by Quilts Plus, the only complete source for all your quilting and other heirloom sewing supplies. Hollis has brought some beautiful miniature quilts with him today, and he's going to tell us about them and the history behind them. It's interesting, Sharon, as we develop in quilt making, and as you know, the renaissance of quilt making has been going now for 20, 25 years. Uh, it seems that occasionally some very enterprising and creative person will go back and pull out of, out of our fabric or textile history some very interesting things. I recently... Uh, learned of a um, woman by the name of Willa Baranowski in Orchard Park, New York, who is doing something called penny squares. And I was very intrigued by that. Penny squares were available between about 1900 and 1930. And you could buy the small squares of muslin that had a transfer design onto it. You could mm -hmm. buy these in the uh, five and 10 stores. And people would buy these 
as a means of kind of keeping idle hands busy. Once you got sufficient number, then you could make a quilt or whatever it was. And so Willa has, has uh, um, really become interested in this and has developed a whole business right around this. Oh, it's fantastic. She has a catalog uh, that shows a number of designs, and she tells me that in her collection she has some, very, some original penny squares. Second thing that, uh, that has intrigued me is a series of patterns developed, um, designed by a company in Marietta, Georgia by the name of Little Quilts. And there are three quilting friends, Alice Berg, Mary Ellen Von Holt, and Sylvia Johnson, called Little Quilts. And they say these are little quilts, not miniature quilts. Aha! Uh -huh. And then the interesting thing about a lot of these, they tie it into the uh, feed bag. I see that the name of this one is Feed Sacks. Feed Sacks, and that again is very popular with quilt historians and collectors, and I have a number of feed bags. Tell, us, tell us quickly how these feed bags originated. They were popular in the late 30s and early 40s, and they were used to um, to store or to market or sell chicken feed, mm -hmm. uh, any kind of feed that was used on the farm. And I have quite a collection here that I take around to quilt shows and sell, and it's interesting the stories that people tell about their particular introduction to feed bags. They were used for clothing, household items, uh, dish towels, whatever. Wonderful prints, and this again has developed, uh, uh, caused a whole industry really to, to develop with people researching the patterns, the designs, and the companies. And so a little girl could go with her father then and pick out her next that's dress, right, when, he her bought, next dress. when he bought some feed for his animals. That's, that's true. <laughs> well, that's really interesting. That The wonderful history behind our quilting is just unlimited, and it goes on and on. It's one of the original American art forms. This new product presentation with Hollis Turnbow has been brought to you by Quilts Plus, the only complete source for all your quilting and other heirloom sewing supplies. Next, I'm going to show you how to do some insertion. And this is, again, a three-step process. First, we're going to just stitch with a straight stitch down the heading of the lace. And I still like to use my foot number 10 to guide the lace. And I have positioned my needle about two or three positions to the left, so it just covers the, the lace heading. Now I'm going to take it out and sew it down the other side. The next thing I'll do is trim. We need to cut up the back of the fabric. And now I'm going to just come over here and press this open. Now I'm going back to my zigzag stitch. I'm going to just move it over one needle position. We were in center needle position last time. We were not quite covering the lace heading. And make it a little narrower. We want to just cover the lace heading and the edge of the fabric. Now we're going to go right back down the other side. Now we'll turn it to the back and we want to trim our excess seam allowance off right close to our zigzag stitch. And because we have done this with a straight stitch first and then folded it back, there's no possibility that this seam is going to pull out away from the lace. 
Be very careful when you're trimming and don't cut your, the face of your fabric. Now again, when you're using thread that matches, you, the thread will not be as noticeable as it is in this little sample I've just run. Also, with thread that matches, you can't see how crooked you've sewn. This is not fair. With matching thread, you have an advantage. So these are the three steps. First, straight stitch the fabric and to the underneath side of the lace. Then trim the back, press it open, and zigzag the edge, and then trim away the excess seam allowance. And this is going to give us a nice, strong seam, and also would create a beautiful bodice for a blouse. Now we're going to go right into puffing. With a puffing strip, we're going to gather on both sides, and I'm going to use foot number 16. We're going to go back to our straight stitch, and we want a stitch length of about three. Now we just need to zip right down the edge. And this gathers as we go. The longer the stitch length, the more that we'll gather. Let's set it for a little bit longer stitch length and see what happens. Now we can adjust the puffing and wasn't that quick and easy? The next thing would, would be to apply some entredeau to the edge and we'll be right back. I'd like to show you this completed piece of fabric that I've made. I've used the Swiss insertion beading with pink ribbon run through it, and those are joined with entredeau. That is then joined to a piece of Swiss batiste, and again, I have entredeau in the middle. I really enjoy using entredeau because I think it adds a lot of strength to your garment. And this is just done in sequence to create the top for the bodice of a little dress. Now, I'd like you to notice that on the back, the seams of the entredeau, the, the seam allowances, have been rolled and whipped over the raw edges of the batiste, so we have no raw edges showing on the back of our garment whatsoever. Now that we have created the front of our dress, we'll take the bodice pattern and lay it over the top, and from here we can mark or pin to cut, cut out the, around the outside edges, and we'll be ready to construct our garment. Another little piece of a bodice that you can see. This was a yoke. This is out of the uh, silk batiste, and I have stitched around the cutting line, and then I cut out the pattern piece. Now these are the basics for French machine sewing. Once you master these, you'll be able to create beautiful garments easily and have heirlooms for everyone. The techniques I've just shown you are some basics of French machine sewing. The next show that we do on French machine sewing, we'll do some pin tucks and some curved lace and get into a little bit more fancy type of work. But you need to learn the basics first, so go and practice. Well, I've really enjoyed visiting with you today. I hope you continue to tune in to Heirlooms by Design. In the coming weeks, we have many exciting techniques to show you. They'll range from quilting, French machine sewing to machine embroidery, and all of them will be heirlooms by design. Heirlooms by Design has been brought to you by Capital Imports, by Omnigrid, and by Quilts Plus. If you'd like more information on the supplies and techniques used in today's show, then drop us a note to Quilts Plus. 1211 Noble Street, Anniston, Alabama, 36201. That's Quilts Plus, 1211 Noble Street, Anniston, Alabama, 36201. Sharon will be back with more Heirlooms by Design next week. <laughs>